It's one of those stories that it's just hard to believe. In fact, I checked several sources just to make sure it was true, and I had my facts straight. Several sources in secular media and Christian media confirmed this story that is troubling on many levels and hard to believe on multiple levels. It happened this past spring in Palmdale, California. Now I know as good Texans, you hear California and you think the whole state is the same, right? You're saying the whole thing is completely liberal and a complete um, loss, right? And, um, and most of it certainly is as far as their politics and beliefs. But I've lived there for four years back in the early 90s and, and I will assure you that there are many, many godly Christian people in the state of California. And Palmdale is known to be a fairly conservative area. At least it was the years we were out there. It's a lot of military folks in Palmdale. It's an hour removed from Los Angeles, more or less. But this story comes out of Palmdale, California. Christiana Zavala is a typical loving mother of her little son, Caleb, seven years old. She would send him notes in his lunch to school, and his notes would include Bible stories. Caleb would share those stories at lunch with his friends at their urging. The students started asking Caleb for their own verses. And so Mrs. Zavala started to provide additional Bible verses for her son's friends. And the verses included short stories for context. However, when one little girl went to her teacher and said, Teacher, this is the most beautiful story I have ever seen, that's when the trouble began. The teacher wrote a note to Christiana informing her that Caleb could no longer read or share the Bible verses or stories at lunch with his friends. We're not talking about in the classroom. We're not talking about during instruction time. We're talking about at lunch. Quote, please tell your son that there is a separation of church and state. The mom correctly informed the teacher that the son had constitutional right to talk about his faith with his classmates during lunchtime, and she kept sending the notes. The teacher then scolded the little boy publicly in class, and he went home crying. The school then came up with the next policy. Caleb was told that the school gate was the only location at which he could give the Bible verses to his friends, and he could only do that after the school bell rang. Mrs. Zavala and her son complied with the school's request and started handing out the verses after school at the gate in late April. It became increasingly popular with at least 15 students showing up every day for their verses and their Bible stories. On May the 9th, Principal Melanie approached Caleb's father, Jamie Zavala, and demanded that he and the boy move completely off of school property and onto the public sidewalk. They immediately complied. Later that day, after a call from someone at the school district, a Los Angeles County deputy sheriff arrived at the Zavala's home to tell the boy to stop sharing the notes because, quote, someone might be offended. At this point, the family sought legal help. They got in touch with Liberty Council, which is a nonprofit group of Christian lawyers who come to the defense of Christians in cases exactly like this. This council sent the school district a letter that said, in part, quote, these actions must be disavowed and reversed to. Re to avoid liability for civil rights violations, and you have until June 1st to respond. June 1st came and went. It was completely ignored. A media spokesman for the sheriff's office initially told WND.com, who may have been the out outlet that, that found this story, I'm not sure, but they told WND.com that this, this spokesman said, we know nothing about a sheriff's deputy going to the home of a seven-year-old at the request of school officials. But then, in a statement on June the 11th, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department confirmed that, yes, in fact, a deputy was sent to the boy's home 
to investigate the dissemination of literature on school grounds. Now listen to this spin. On May the 9th, 2016, a school resource deputy from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department made contact with the parents of a student regarding the dissemination of literature on school grounds. The statement read. This is a statement now from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. They go on and they say this. Upon making contact with the student's parents and learning more about what had occurred, the deputy reaffirmed the student's rights and provided the parents information on the school's policy for distribution of materials. We thank our community and school partners, including the faith community, for their support of our deputy's professional and compassionate demeanor while interacting with the student and his family. Please. <laughs> In an interview with Fox News, Roger Gannam, who is the lawyer with Liberty Council representing the family, he summed it up well. He said, quote, you have ignorance of the law, hostility toward Christianity, and a gross abuse of police power. End quote. I think the most troubling thing about this entire story is the fact that a deputy sheriff showed up at all to question this family and this seven-year-old boy. I will add to the lawyer's statement there, this is how persecution begins. We will call this hostility, and that would be the right word for it, as he said. But beloved, this is how it begins. 21 centuries ago, our brothers and sisters in Thessalonica, who are now in heaven, were experiencing escalating hatred in their own culture and escalating hostility that became threats worthy of the word persecution. Paul writes in both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians to encourage these suffering afflicted believers who are increasingly under fire for their faith in Christ. We find ourselves this morning still in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, if you'll join me there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 in our New Testament, about halfway through, more or less. Here's a short letter by the Apostle Paul, a follow-up letter to his first one, six months later. And the challenges that face this church have only grown. Paul writes them then to encourage them in light of Christ's second coming, a doctrine mentioned 318 times, one form or another, in the New Testament. Paul writes them not only to encourage them in light of, listen, in light of the second coming, but he writes them to encourage them by the second coming. The reality of this event that is coming in human history would be their primary means of encouragement. And so this is encouragement for persecuted Christians, part two. Let's read verse, uh, verses 3 through 12 of chapter 1. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. And now here's our text for today. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Those two verses are our text for today. I will keep reading the rest of the chapter. And to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed. For our testimony to you was believed. To this end also we pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, our text will be verses 5 and 6 this morning as we're in part 2 of encouragement and comfort for the persecuted Christian. 
We're outlining this chapter this way. We're going to ask and answer four connected questions that will encourage us in light of present hostilities and coming persecution if the Lord tarries. Our first question we looked at last week by way of review is this. In the midst of persecution, can we still be thankful? And Paul gives a resounding yes in verses 3 and 4 that we can be thankful for the faith of persecuted believers, the love that grows, and the endurance that is put on display when those pressures come. In other words, God uses these afflictions and difficulties to bring to the surface something that was already there and to put it on display. And then that allows us to thank God both for the circumstances or in the circumstances and mostly then for the response of his people. We said that there is nothing like persecution and affliction to reveal whether our faith is real, whether we love other Christians. You know, is it going to cost us? To love another Christian, that's when we find out if it's real. And then whether we have our hope set on what it should be on. The second question we want to ask and answer then is this. What does our faithful endurance of persecution reveal? What does our faithful endurance of hostility reveal? And the answer is found in verses 5 and 6. And and it's a two-part answer. It's It reveals one thing for believers, and it reveals something else for unbelievers. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. For believers, then, what afflictions reveal is whether or not we are worthy of the kingdom of God. Worthy of the kingdom of God. Did you see the word there in verse 5? Did you see it again in verse 11? The word worthy. Now let's be clear. To see the kingdom of God or to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. We come into this world sinful because we have a sin nature. We are spiritually dead. We do not have a relationship with God. We're not always a Christian. If anybody ever tells you, yeah, I've always been a Christian, that's a red flag ought to go up in your Christian brain that says, uh, well, you may think that and you may actually be a Christian, but you haven't always been a Christian, right? We come into the world spiritually dead, and if we're going to see the kingdom and if we're going to enter the kingdom, we must be born again from above. John chapter 3, this was the message of Jesus to Nicodemus. This born again is all by the power of God. It's monergistic, not synergistic. God births a dead soul and brings a person into his uh, belief and into his kingdom eventually. So we're not talking about how we're saved here. We're not talking about the fact that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We're talking about what's on the other side of that for believers and whether they are going to be worthy Worthy of entrance into the kingdom of God. Worthy of a presence in the kingdom of God. What Paul is teaching here is not how to be saved. These people are already saved. We're saved by faith. What he is teaching here is that to be worthy in the kingdom, you must suffer for it well. That's one way to be worthy. Again, not worthy in a salvific sense, but as, as if we deserve To be in heaven when we're in heaven. We're not saying that. We're saying it's in a sense of I have proven my identity while I was on earth. Worthy in the sense of I have proven by my obedience that I am a disciple. Worthy in the sense that I have worked out my salvation with fear and trembling while I was present on earth. I have borne fruit, and God can say that is a true disciple. Suffering hostility or persecution then proves our faith. It doesn't produce it, it proves it, and this endurance reveals our worthiness. The endurance of affliction reveals our worthiness, it doesn't make us worthy. So, beloved, we can say endurance then says, now just whatever that trial is, whatever that affliction, but especially persecution. If you've got a person going through that and they're enduring that and they're not renouncing Christ and they're not running from it and they're not hiding from it, that person is saying, by their endurance, Christ is my king. 
right? That person is saying, by their endurance, not their words, their endurance, I live for Jesus. I don't live for comfort. I don't live for the world. I don't live for my, this friend to like me or love me. I live for Jesus. That's what endurance says. The endurance of suffering says to those who are watching, He is worth it. He is worth it. And I will persevere by His grace. Endurance then preaches that God is in control. And God is a just God. And God is going to punish the persecutor and reward the persecuted. Our endurance says this to the world. It is our platform of preaching and the platform of every suffering saint. The very endurance of clinging to Christ and not renouncing Christ says to the world, I believe God will right every wrong. My life is in His hands. My hope is in Him. All of this then proves us to be worthy of taking up space in the millennial kingdom. Of, of, of serving the great king in his kingdom. Let me try to illustrate it. The NBA just opened their training camps for the coming season. There will be a team that makes, uh, there will be a group of guys that make the Spurs roster. They're all on the team, alright? They're all on the team. But they're not all worthy to start. All of the starters will play the most of the minutes, but they're not all worthy to be all-stars. All of the all-stars will play in the all-star game, but they're not all worthy to be in the Hall of Fame. What often separates the guy who's just on the team from the guy who's in the Hall of Fame? What separates them? What separates them is effort, devotion, dedication. What separates them is People who are willing to deny themselves and suffer for their sport. And those who are willing to do that at the highest levels eventually have this kind of worthiness pronounced upon them. I say so it is with Christians. That is an illustration of what we're talking about here. What separates Christians that are worthy of the kingdom from Christians that are not worthy is their devotion and dedication and effort. And in this context, the ability to suffer trials and persecution and endure it. Not quitting. Not throwing in the towel. Let me be clear. (laughs) Suffering does not make us worthy. We're not saved by suffering. Suffering proves that we're worthy. Suffering demonstrates that we're worthy. Enduring suffering then proves that God did not waste a draft pick. He did not waste a draft pick on that individual. Grace through faith is the ticket at the entrance at the gate of heaven. But endurance proves that the ticket is not counterfeit. That the ticket is genuine and real and the faith is real. This is another way of saying the perseverance of the saints. We don't like to use the phrase here, once saved, always saved, though it is true enough, but it is misleading. We would rather say perseverance of the saints, because once saved, always saved, acts like you can just pray a prayer, walk an aisle, make a profession of faith once in your life, and then live no different the rest of your life, and then bank on this mental ascent that you made way back here. Though there was no endurance in the faith, no perseverance in the faith, no demonstration of the faith. So the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints says a believer must believe until the end, and in fact, he or she will, by God's grace. So let me ask a question then at this point in the message. As we're thinking about believers here who are suffering hostility and persecution, as as we look around our landscape, and certainly we are seeing hostilities on the rise, not torture, not Not death necessarily uh, on any kind of wide scale case in America. And we would pray that it would never be. We would pray that God would never allow us to lose these freedoms. But as we think about these believers who were. And as we think about Paul encouraging them with with the worthiness that this is demonstrating in their life. Let me just ask you this question. 
Are we living each day to prove to God that we are worthy of His calling into His kingdom? I've, I've really been stopped here this week in my study, and I think, I think we've just discovered an ocean of motivation that has been untapped. An ocean of motivation that I know I am saved by grace and it's all a pure gift, but God, now that you've saved me, I want to demonstrate to you that I am worthy of being saved. I want to prove to you that the gift you gave is real and I am appreciative. I want to, out of a life of gratitude, I want to serve you to my utmost because I want to make you proud that you have chosen and saved me. I think this is a, 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 a place of motivation that we haven't tapped into. This is the plain, verse 5, the plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered, counted, calculated, worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. Not to earn God's forgiveness, but to earn a reward. That's what we're talking about, aren't we? We're really talking about rewards. We're talking about I want to earn by my life, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Listen, that's, you're, we're not going to stumble into that, all right? You're not going to back into that. That's going to take effort, dedication, devotion. That's going to take single-minded pursuit. You're not going to coast into well done, my good and faithful servant. Are we going to live like we want to make our dad proud? We want to make our father smile, not to get in, but because we're already on our way. What Paul is really referring here to is a pronouncement that God Himself will make. Can you imagine? And certainly the faithful martyrs and the faithful sufferers that are suffering right now persecution will hear this. When they enter the kingdom, there will be a pronouncement by God Himself, worthy, worthy to be here. What a pronouncement. Can I say it this way? Let's just back away from suffering for a moment. We ought to have and pursue so many good works in our life that if people didn't know any better, they, were, they would think we're trying to work our way into heaven. Right? We ought to be so zealous for good deeds that people assume, unbelievers I mean, assume that person is working their way in. And we know we're not. We know that we're trying to prove ourselves worthy. Next part of this question the second question of our four but the next part of this one is then what does a persecuted believer's endurance reveal about the one doing the persecuting what does the suffering saying who takes the blows and doesn't lash out who who takes the verbal abuse and doesn't return it in kind who the, the pastor in china hanging by his feet beaten with rods and, and when he has a, an opportunity to, to retaliate against a captor does not but instead loves that captor and tells that captor about Christ what does that reveal to the persecutor? it reveals that their day of judgment is coming their day of judgment from God himself is coming because the one being persecuted is not trying to bring it about right now. Does that make sense? The one who is being persecuted does not retaliate. And by not retaliating, that sends the message that God will vindicate me. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And so we don't take vengeance into our own hands. We don't kill back. We don't torture back. We don't verbally abuse back. Because we are wanting to say, God is a just God and you will have your day in court. Oh, persecutor. That was all of Psalm 37, was it not? Wasn't that the message of Psalm 37? 
Judgment day is coming. A day of reckoning is coming for these evil people. And God will pay back the very affliction that they handed out. It will be eye for eye and tooth for tooth. We even think back to the days of old in Israel and Egypt. Egypt persecuting God's people and they got their just desserts. We think back to Assyria persecuting Israel and the angel of the Lord dropping dead 185,000 in one night. We think back even on an individual scale to King Saul and his persecution of David and how King Saul's life ended in such misery and such shame. Paul assures them here and comforts them here, just like the book of Revelation will comfort the persecuted then. Verse 6, For after all it is only just or righteous for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. He will repay with tribulation those who tribulate you. They afflicted the body of Christ and so God will afflict them through Christ, His appointed judge. And it is the endurance of the saint instead of retaliation that demonstrates that the captors are wrong about Christ. And God is going to pay them back. Turn to Philippians chapter 1. We, we see a great commentary on this. Philippians chapter 1. Uh, and I, I fear that some of this doesn't resonate with us because we're not part of the persecuted church. But this is uh, cover to cover in the Word of God. God holds out for His suffering people the, flag, the fact that He will afflict our persecutors. But look at Philippians 1 verse 27. Paul says to another suffering church, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, worthy of the good news of Christ, worthy of God's message of love to the world. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of that. So that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Not the law, not striving together for the faith of the law, not retaliation, not payback. But for the gospel, a gospel of sacrifice, of dying to oneself, of, of dying that you might live, of, of God's love for the sinner. Verse 28, in no way alarmed by your opponents. Which is a sign. Listen, the fact that you're not alarmed is a sign of destruction for them. It's a message. We're not scared. We're not alarmed. We're not surprised. But of salvation for you and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. So there's a real cross-reference to what Paul is saying here in this chapter. If we pay them back, we blur this revelation. We convolute this message, don't we? But when we don't strike back, when we stand firm in the faith of the gospel, when we love our enemies, when we pray for those who persecute us, when we do them good, when we heap burning coals upon their head by actually giving them food and drink, by meeting their needs, by sacrificing ourselves for their highest good, when we do all of that, we send a message that our Father loves them in Christ and will repay them if they don't repent. <laughs> we send a message that our God is more just and more fair and more powerful than we are anyway. So who are we to bring about justice when God does it so much better? So you see what's happening here. Paul is wanting them to see the bigger picture of their suffering. He, he wants them to see that it's not just about you, one person. It's not just about you, one church. It's not just about you, one nation, Christians in Iran or Christians in Saudi Arabia. It's not just about you. There is a bigger picture here. There's something else going on, and here's what it is. God is wanting to show the world that He is both a God who rewards and a God who punishes. He is a God who brings justice and a God who brings grace. In the end, Christ 
Himself, the appointed judge of all men, Christ Himself will mete out a perfect justice on all gospel-rejecting persecutors, and He will give a perfect reward on the victims of persecution. In other words, nothing escapes God's notice. God is just simply waiting until the end. God is waiting to judge the persecutors and reward the persecuted until He sends His Son. Because the Son is the means by which He will do it. And He is still in heaven. And so until He comes, this won't happen. And so we are to wait and pray and hope in that return. It will be a return of reward and a, ter- and a return of punishment. The reward will in fact launch the punishment. And in Paul's mind and in the mind of the Holy Spirit, all of this should encourage the persecuted Christian. That's why it's here. I want to close with three uh, soul-searching questions that I think spring from this passage and this concept and this text. Three soul-searching questions for all of us to ask ourselves. So I can just ask them to your ears, but you've got to ask it to your heart. Number one, do I live in such a, an overt Christian life that hostility is even possible? Now, I'm not saying go seek it and go have a martyr complex and invite it by being obnoxious and stupid. You know, we are to be innocent as doves and shrewd as serpents. But I'm just asking myself, ask you to ask yourself, do I live such an overt Christian life that hostility is even possible in my life? Or am I an incognito, invisible, silent Christian who only a few people closest to me even know what I believe and profess? Am I an overt Christian or a secret disciple? Am I standing up for Christ, come what may, or am I slinking around in the shadows and hiding my faith in Him? That's a question I think this text begs of us, does it not? Does it not? I mean, we're not going to ever experience hostility if nobody knows what we believe. And what we stand for. And what the truth is. Second question. How am I actually different from my nice, moral, unbelieving neighbor? How am I actually different from my nice, moral, unbelieving neighbor? Does my life and words prove I'm a Christian? And not just a polite southerner. Do my actions and my words prove that I'm a Christian and not just a polite Bible Belt, Southerner. Third question. Am I known more for conservative politics? Or my favorite sports teams? Or my passion for guns? Or my hatred of Obama and Hillary? Than as a follower of Christ. So when people think of you... What do they first think? When people who know you, people who are around you, people who watch your life, when they think of you, what is the first thing that they think about? Is it any of those things or a whole other list that we could come up with? Or is it that person follows Christ? That person knows Christ. That person is a professing Christian. That's what I know about them. I think these are soul-searching questions we need to be asking ourselves. Not that we would ever want persecution. Not that we would ever invite persecution. But do I live an overt Christian life that makes hostility even possible? How am I different from my nice, unbelieving, polite neighbor? And three... What am I most known for? What am I most known for? We bow with me in prayer. Father, we uh, desire to be counted and considered 
worthy of the kingdom of God. Worthy of our calling. Worthy of the gospel of Christ. God, we pray and we plead to make us so. Lord, we want to go from just being on the team to, if you will, being in the Hall of Fame. May that be the desire of our heart. May we be zealous for good deeds. May we learn to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Christ, no matter the consequences. God, may we pursue Christ's likeness more than safety and more than comfort, more than being loved and liked and fitting in. God, I just feel like these Christians of the first century just expose a lot of shallowness in us. A lot of weakness and lack of zeal and lack of boldness. I just feel like they're towering giants of the faith and we're just little grasshoppers in our little safe little bubble. God, there's no telling how many people, the people in this room right now, know and touch and influence. It's exponential and it's astronomical because it never stops. I pray you'd help us to be salt and light in this decaying and dark culture. I pray that you would help us to be counted worthy of our King. Help me. Help me today to tap into this ocean of motivation that I feel like God up till now has just kind of been over here to the side. We pray this in Jesus' name and for Jesus' glory.